Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being able to spend some time with us. We know that it is an amazingly nice day outside, that it is also Friday afternoon. And so we tremendously appreciate your vote of confidence in being here um, to hear our keynote speaker for the uh, awards and um, uh, homecoming you know, weekend um, celebration. So um, we're delighted to be able to welcome back our um, wonderful alum, Soheb Abbasi. Soheb's a technology pioneer and a business executive. He has a long track record of leading and growing enterprise software companies. As the chairman and CEO, he guided Informatica's growth from a $200 million company with 800 employees to a billion dollar firm with 3,700 employees over an 11 year period. Today, Informatica is one of the largest independent leaders in the data integration enterprise software market. Prior to Informatica, Soheb was an early employee at a little database company you may have heard of called Oracle, where he spent 21 years um, helping to lead the company's transformation from a small private company, database company with, get this, 30 employees um, to an industry leading public company with 42,000 employees worth $10 billion. One of the highlights of his tenure at Oracle was conceiving, launching, and growing Oracle's tools business unit, which he grew to $3 billion in cumulative revenue. Soheb has received many awards for his executive leadership, including the 2010 Chairman of the Year Award from the American Business Awards. In 2013, Bloomberg ranked him second in its top 20 list of all-time business turnaround CEOs in technology, and Forbes rated him as one of the top five best CEOs to work for in the enterprise software business. Soheb graduated from Illinois with bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science, and throughout his career, he's remained active with his alma mater. He served on the U of I Foundation Board of Directors Budget and Finance Committee and founded an executive alumni roundtable in Silicon Valley. A philanthropist, he and his wife Sarah established an endowed professorship and a fellowship in computer science at Illinois. And they've also endowed a program in Islamic studies at Stanford University. Um, Soheb is also a 2012 inductee in the Engineering at Illinois Hall of Fame. And we're delighted to welcome him back to, to offer our keynote for our awards today. So please give a warm welcome to Soheb Abbasi. Uh, it is indeed a privilege to be here on this special occasion to recognize the award winners, a very impressive list of distinguished alumni and faculty members. And it is also a time, uh, a reminder in terms of how much we all owe the instrumental role that University of Illinois has played in all of our careers. In fact, my personal career journey started right here. At a very different time. And the reason why I have, you may be wondering, why do I have President Nixon's picture as my opening slide? It happened to be the month that I arrived. I landed in uh, Urbana-Champaign. President Nixon became the first president ever to resign from office. And in case you were wondering how much a car cost, a new Toyota cost $2,299. It has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of my presentation. But I just wanted to give you a sense of my beginnings in Urbana-Champaign and my career journey. When I arrived in Urbana-Champaign, by then I had never used a computer. And the professors, these are some of the photos of the professors that taught me computer science. At least one of them you will remember, who is sitting here in the audience. My thesis advisor was Geneva Belford. And my master's thesis, the topic was the design of relational database operators as an extension to an experimental programming language. The title clearly demonstrates my early marketing skills. Such a catchy title, everyone had to read one of those. Now, little did I know at that time that that would turn out to be the single most important decision of my entire career. And I remember classes that were taught by uh, Professor Campbell on Pat Pascal. I didn't do so well in that class. I need to talk to him about that particular topic. <laughs> but I also remember classes taught by many of the faculty members over here. Now, 
Clearly, Illinois prepared me well for my career. However, Illinois prepared me for the real world as well, as I will explain next. Now, here are some of the highlight some of the highlights about how Illinois prepared me for the real world. In 1974, streaking. Now, I had never witnessed anything quite like it till Illinois. For those of you that are too young to know what streaking is, please ask your parents <laughs> what it was all about. But my Illinois experience, uh, first scholarships for a female uh, athlete in 1975, first Hash Wednesday in 1977, another first for me at least, the first disco in 1979, those were the days. So clearly, after Illinois, I was ready for my jo first job in the real world. So today, I'll talk about two topics. One is the lessons from my experience of working at Oracle and Informatica. And the second one is, if I were to start my career today, how would I prepare for the next big thing? So let me tell you a little bit about uh, my career. Let me start. Uh, in 1980, I got my first job as a programmer at a 100-person uh, company called Professional Computer Resources, PCR. In fact, one of my colleagues from PCR is sitting right here, Ira Cohen. So he could tell you what it was like back in the good old days of working on an IBM mini computer. While I was working at PCR, I went to my first industry trade show. As a programmer, it's not common to go to a trade show. I happened to go to one, and I ran across a startup called RSI. And RSI were demonstrating a relational database called Oracle. What an incredible coincidence. It happened to be the thesis, my thesis topic, and here's a company that was actually developing that. So I joined Oracle, uh, RSI. In fact, later on, I'm going to tell you how I really got my job. And I'll also tell you how Tom Sebo got his first job. So you'll have to sit there and listen to everything else before I tell you about how Tom Sebo got the first job in the computer industry. But it has an Illinois connection. Now, RSI changed its name to Oracle, the same as the product name. When I joined Oracle, Oracle did not have an office uh, in Chicago. And there were no customers in the Midwest. So my second job after college was to start Oracle's sales operations in the Midwest out of my apartment. The commute couldn't have been better. Uh, now, of course, Oracle has an office, quite a few offices, and it's an industry giant. Now, when I joined Oracle, it, uh, the uh, revenues were $4 million. Now, every year it doubled for about eight years. And by 2003, the revenue were nearly $10 billion. And it was the second largest software company in the world. And that tremendous growth meant amazing returns for the investors. 29,000% if you had invested when the company went public in 1986. Now, if anyone had invested $100 in 1982, it would have become a $1 million by 2003 and $3 million today. That's not a bad investment. So after 20 years at Oracle, I thought it was time for a change. So I joined Informatica as the CEO in 2004. Informatica was a leader in a category called ETL, which stood for Extract, Transform, Load. Very descriptive, not a particularly catchy title. Uh, it, ETL is used for moving and integrating data primarily through relational databases. 
So once again, I did not stray very far from my master's thesis, and Illinois had prepared me well for my entire career. At Informatica, my career, Informatica, uh, I joined in 2004. In the prior three years, Informatica had not grown. Since 2004, for the next 10 years, it grew twice as fast as the enterprise software industry. And that, and in 2014, it exceeded $1 billion in revenue, which makes it one of the top three software companies to have attained that distinction. And that sustained growth worked well for the investors. Over that period of time, the stock went up eightfold. So today, what I'd like to do is sum up what did I learn from that experience. It's specifically, the lessons from my experience how did the company succeed? So what I'd like to talk about today are my observations about three aspects, the idea, the strategy, and the team. My first observation is the winners copy and commercialize other people's ideas. My second observation is the winners Strategy is guided by four words, show me the money. And the third observation is they inspire a team and inspire even skeptics to become zealots. So let me elaborate on that. The most successful company in our industry have copied other companies' ideas. Oracle copied IBM's idea. IBM came up with the original uh, relational database. They called it System R. Oracle copied it and called it Oracle. Apple copied Xerox. Xerox pioneered the personal computer with a graphical user interface and a mouse. Xerox called it the Star. Apple called it first the Lisa, and then they called it the Mac. Microsoft co uh, copied Apple. Microsoft Windows was a copy of Apple Mac. It is remarkable when you think about it that a copy of a copy, Microsoft Windows, which was a copy of uh, Apple Mac, which was a copy of Xerox Star, dominated the entire computing world. So the lesson is most winners are cheaters. And they copy other people's ideas. So now what I'm going to talk about is why did they succeed? And why did the original people that came up with the idea did not, why did they not succeed? Professor Campbell and others that uh, are here, perhaps Ira, remembers that in the early 1970s, IBM published original research on the relational database model. And they even went beyond, and then they wrote specifications and made those available of a system called System R. In other words, IBM came up with the relational database idea and even wrote the specification of a new language called SQL, which, by the way, back then was spelled out, not SQL. It was entire word, SQL. Oracle beat IBM. So the question is, how could a copy beat the original? How did that happen? A copy beat the original. So let me tell you about that. In 1983, while I was uh, working in Chicago, we tried to sell Oracle to uh, Kellogg, the cereal company in Kalamazoo. And I found out that they had been using IBM's product for one year. IBM did not aggressively sell their own product for another two years. So the question really is, why would IBM not aggressively sell their own product? And it turns out that IBM did not want to sell the new idea and the new product because they were concerned that it would reduce the sale of their old product called IMS. In other words, it was not in IBM's business interest to promote its own innovation, Oracle won. So the lesson that I learned is commercialization 
always trumps invention and innovation. Now, I have one other observation. which is the importance of focus. In order to succeed, you ha focus is critical. It's very difficult for anyone or any company to do one, pursue one idea well. It is next to impossible to pursue multiple ideas. So I'll explain why is it that Informatica did not grow for three years. Informatica experienced tremendous growth as a leader in the category called ETL. Enamored and tempted by the lofty valuation of some of the dot-com companies, Informatica entered another market segment called analytic applications. And when they entered that for the next three years with the lack of focus, product revenue actually declined. In 2004, after I joined as CEO, we refocused the company on the core ETL category and broadly redefined that category to data integration and Informatica grew for the next 10 years twice as fast. So twice as fast as the industry. So the lesson uh, from it, to sum it up, is the winners copy and commercialize other companies' ideas one idea at a time. So how do the winners come up with a winning strategy? And as I mentioned earlier, the winning strategy is usually guided by a very simple philosophy, which is show me the money. That's the principle. Or to be more precise, show the customer the money, show the customer the value. And let me elaborate how Oracle, the early days of Oracle. Now, when I joined RSI, now called Oracle, in 1982, our challenge was to convince customers to buy an unproven technology from an unknown company. How hard could that be? Uh, a re Oracle relational database from a 30-person startup that no one has heard of, RSI, was a very risky proposition. So then naturally the customers ask us, can you name other companies that are using Oracle? That was a problem. We had no other companies that were using Oracle. The situation looked very dire. And for, during the, my first uh, six months at Oracle, we sold nothing at all. Then we took a different approach. And we told the new approach was we would tell the customer, references are great, but you are unlike any other business. You're unique. Give us a day. We will come and we will show you what we could do for your business. And that got their attention. So my job was after we made that comment was I would go in, they'd uh, tell me what their business problem was, and I would solve the problem in front of them. So I learned a very important lesson, which is solutions to actual business problems are more compelling than the elegance of the technology. So Oracle's sales approach was show the customer the value, show the customer the money. It was not the elegance of the relational database. Now, Oracle was not alone. There was IBM. IBM had its uh, product. So the question is, how can a small competitor win over a much bigger competitor? The first step is to identify what is the primary strength of that competitor? What is the one thing that they cannot afford to lose? And time and again, we've seen competitors, small competitors, use the bigger competitor's strength as a weakness. And I'll illustrate that. In 1980, IBM was the undisputed leader in hardware. It was the only company that mattered. 
To preserve and to maintain that lead, IBM software only ran on its own hardware. They thought that that was a way for them to maintain their lead in hardware. By 1985, there were a lot of hardware companies that had emerged, like DEC, Data General, HP. Many of them don't matter anymore. But back then, they mattered. And customers wanted the flexibility of choosing between those companies and IBM. Oracle software ran on all of the hardware. And the customers had that choice of deploying Oracle on any of that, any computer that they wanted. That advantage was called portability. Now, Oracle was a copy of IBM. And by definition, what that meant was they could get everything from Oracle that IBM gave them. Of course, Oracle did not call it copy. They call it compatibility. That sounds so much better. That I have written compatible software. It's not a copy. It's just compatible. So next time somebody, one of your professors asks you about plagiarism, it's just, it's just compatible with it. You can try that. It certainly worked for Oracle. I'm not suggesting that, by the way. Uh, now, in other words, the combination, uh, Oracle used IBM's advantage, IBM's strength against them. I'll give you one other example, a more recent example. How did a smaller company like Informatica compete with industry giants, my previous employer, and the other in, uh, industry giants, Oracle, IBM, and SAP? By 2005, these companies provided a very big portfolio of products, a complete stack of software. And their aspiration was they wanted to be the only technology company that the customer relied on. Now, the customer reality is very different. The customers already rely on many of those organizations, many of the technologies from all of those. And they wanted, the customers wanted to leverage all of their assets, all of their data. Informatica was viewed as a Switzerland of all things data. And actually, people liked when I said, we are the Switzerland of all things data. What that meant was, Informatic, they could rely on Informatica to get their data, regardless of where it resides, which would be difficult to, for, with the others. So another example of how a, a smaller company used the competitor's strength against them. So to sum up, my second observation is that the winner's strategy is guided by a simple principle, show me the money. Now the third. How did the winners build uh, the team, the first step? And how did they inspire even the skeptics to become zealots? So the first step is recruiting. So I'm going to tell you about my job interview. This is my picture. I used to obviously had a lot more hair from my student ID. And a picture of Larry Ellison back in those days. So two days after the trade show in Chicago, I got a call from the founder, Larry Ellison, and he invited me for an interview in California. Illinois had prepared me incredibly well for that interview because I had studied all of the, data, the latest database research, and I knew that Oracle was a copy. So one of my first questions to Larry Ellison was, in what way have you innovated? which obviously got his attention. And he said that they, were, they had added this new feature, and he described this new feature to allow you to query, build a material data. An example of that would be, show me all of the connecting flights between Urbana-Champaign that, that start off in Urbana-Champaign, was an example of that. Now, knowing what I did from University of Illinois, I knew that there were certain things that just simply could not be expressed. So I asked him, could you show me all of the flight uh, between Urbana-Champaign that originate in Urbana-Champaign and terminate in San Francisco? And obviously, he did not have an answer. Now, for those of you that are curious in terms of what about that could not be done, transitive closure cannot be expressed in relational algebra. 
you could look it up. But that insight, actually, I actually was able, uh, so it was an unusual interview. I did, he offered me a job. I accepted the job to start the sales operations in the Midwest with one condition. And my condition was I wanted to have the flexibility of going back into a product development role. So I started my job two years later. I called Larry Ellison and reminded him of that offer that he had that I could return into a product development role. And he had only one condition for me to move. And the condition was, find a replacement for yourself. And I called my thesis advisor, Geneva Belford. And Geneva Belford said, there is this MCS graduate that you have to meet. His name is Tom Siebel. <laughs> so Tom, Tom came to interview for my job. And I interviewed him. And of course, he got the job. So he got my job, and obviously he's done great things to, for the university. I take credit for everything he's ever done for <laughs> you guys, because if it hadn't been for me, he wouldn't be in a position to provide all the resources. So next time you meet Tom, remind him of that. <laughs> uh, and I transferred into product development. So the Illinois connection comes in very handy in extraordinary ways. But the question remains is, how do you build a world-class team? Now, this is a photo of the founders of Oracle, the three, three founders and the first employee. And I'll tell you about my experience. My experience is there is no one effective way to inspire and get the best out of people. Everyone has their own way of inspiring. My first boss at Oracle, was Gary Kennedy. Now, Gary is an incredibly intense individual who is never satisfied, who always demands more. One word description of his management style, challenge. My second boss at uh, Oracle was the technical founder, Bob Miner. Bob's management style can best be described as benign neglect. And he once joked with me, he said, if I have to tell you what to do, we have a big problem. So I would characterize his management style as trust. I worked for Larry Ellison for a number of years. He is, he is by far the most visionary driven individual I have ever worked with. One word description for his management style is inspire. Now each one of them was able to inspire even the skeptics to become believers, and the believers to become zealots. So my, the way I would sum up the lessons of, uh, of my experience is the winners usually copy and commercialize other people's ideas, guided by the principle, show me the money, leading a team of zealots. For my next topic, how do you prepare for the next big thing? To set the context, I want to actually outline the evolution of the computer industry. And I want to actually talk about the previous big things, because it will set the stage for the next big thing. Each previous big thing has delivered an order of magnitude more value to more users and ushered in a new era of computing. And each new era of computing has provided opportunities for new companies to emerge as world-class leaders. But the most remarkable thing, if you think about it, is in every era, Illinois alumni have made an, in, have made an incredible contribution, have played instrumental role. So the first generation of computing mainframe computing, automated certain functions in the back office, like finance and accounting. And this era of computing was utterly and totally dominated by one company, IBM. And there were Illinois alumni that made an incredible contribution. Richard 
Hemming, uh, won the Turing Award for reliable transmission of digital data. Gene Samet, alumna from University of Illinois, managed all of the programming language development at IBM. The second generation of computing automated certain front office functions like sales and marketing. This client server generation of computing was dominated by new companies, Microsoft and Intel for client, Oracle for servers, SAP and Siebel for applications. An Oracle alumnus, Bob Miner, and an uh, 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 Illinois alumnus, Bob Miner, and an Illinois dropout, Larry Ellison, founded Oracle. Another uh, uh, Illinois alumnus, Tom Siebel, led Siebel Systems. The third generation of computing delivered great value to millions of consumers by automating e-commerce transactions. And this era of computing was shaped by new players like Netscape, Sun, and Amazon. Yet another Illinois alumnus, Mark Andreessen, founded Netscape. The next generation of computing is making computing affordable. This cloud era is being shaped by new players, Salesforce.com, uh, uh, Amazon, AWS, Microsoft, Azure. And yet again, another Illinois alumnus, Ray Ozzie, laid out the roadmap for Microsoft cloud computing. The next generation of computing went far beyond and enabled billions of users to engage in social communities. And this era is being shaped by new players like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And yet again, Illinois alumni, Steve Chen and Jawed Karim founded YouTube. And the final or the next frontier, Internet of Things, which promises to enrich our lives. Sensors on cars for self-driving cars, sensors to diagnose and treat disease. And yet again, another Illinois alumnus, Tom Siebel, and in fact, some faculty members with Embedded Technologies, Professor Gulaga, at, are at the forefront of it. So with that as the background about the previous big things, the question I want to ask is, what are the skills that best prepare you for the new, for the next big thing? And the related question is, are the same skills that I possess, that many of us possess, as relevant in this new world as they were in, the, uh, in what has already happened? Now let me take a look and tell you what the skills were that were important in the old world. In the old world of IT, business computing had only one purpose. And the purpose was to improve productivity of businesses by automating transactions one department at a time. It started off with accounting transactions being automated using mainframe applications like McCormick and Dodge and mainframe databases like IMS and IDMS. And then it moved on to automating manufacturing transactions using mini computer applications like Bon and SAP and early relational databases like Oracle and Ingress. Then it was automating the HR transactions using client server applications like PeopleSoft and databases like Oracle and relational databases like Oracle and Informix. Then it was automating customer-facing uh, transactions using applications like Siebel and Oracle or Sybase. And then finally, it was automating procurement transactions using web-based applications, perhaps Ariba, with OLTP databases, including IBM DB2. Now, the skills 
that were the most valued in this world were all technology skills. A degree in computer science prepared you well for this world. The most valued skill, to be more precise, were database skills, middleware skills, application skills. In the new world of IT, everything changes. Because computing has evolved from a world, from the age of productivity to the age of engagement. Technology skills are still very important, but interdisciplinary skills are more important than ever before. And let me talk, uh, talk you uh, through some of the changes that are going on. Business productivity is still important, like it was before. But there are two ways you could achieve that, through on-premise applications like Oracle or SAP, or cloud services like Salesforce.com or Workday. But now, businesses are doing a lot more. Businesses are managing their brand, using social media to engage with millions of their customers, and managing that interaction data using newer technologies like Hadoop. Businesses are engaging in very personalized ways using mobile app. And these mobile apps are being developed with new programming languages like Swift and using new data stores like NoSQL databases. Internet of Things promises to enrich our life in many ways. And again, it, those are being developed using new technologies and using proprietary data stores for a lot of that data. Now, the skills that are needed in this world are not the same skills as they were needed in the old world. Computer uh, uh, science is still important, but interdisciplinary skills are particularly important. And that's why I was very impressed when I found out about the CS plus X program, the fact that University of Illinois, just as it prepared me with the master's thesis that have, has, that's all I've done in my entire life. The master's thesis was enough for me to have been employed for as long as I've been employed for. Once again, they're providing you with an opportunity, the CS plus X, uh, with six other disciplines that are available today, astronomy, linguistics, uh, chemistry. There are three more that I'm told will be available soon, including music, uh, advertising as another one. Uh, and the thing that amazed me the most was when I found out that 50% of the admitted freshmen in computer science are enrolled in CS plus X. So once again, Illinois is providing all the opportunities, the skills that are needed for the next big thing. So what could they be? What, what could the next big thing be? There are software developers that are developing apps and services for the digital native. I'm not one of them. Digital native are the ones that grew up with technology. And their expectations are very different than my expectations. Their expectation is, that all the user experiences should look like Facebook or the social media experiences that they're used to. Those expectations can only be met through interdisciplinary innovations. Innovations that span philosophy, arts, music, design, computer science. That's the future. Another big thing is, of course, the impact that Internet of Things is having on all kinds of things. The way we, the, our everyday transportation with sensors, about how sensors will detect all the traffic information, traffic patterns, and automatically navigate. That reality can only be attained through interdisciplinary innovation that spans many different disciplines, logistics, uh, computer science, a lot of different disciplines, and I actually had an uh, opportunity to actually talk to some of the, the work that is going on over here. Uh, and I'm very impressed by all of the different professors that are doing work in this area. 
The industrial internet, the promise of it is to change uh, processes, uh, is to transform industrial uh, companies. GE and Honeywell uh, is, are investing heavily into it to become industrial internet companies. And even today, we're finding that a lot of the processes are being uh, changed and transformed through 3D printing and other technologies. Now, many of these innovations that are required are likely going to require a lot of interdisciplinary innovations across a lot of different uh, disciplines. And once again, at the University of Illinois, there are a lot of work that is going on. In fact, uh, let me tell you about some of the things that I saw earlier today. In the previous uh, slide that I showed you, Professor Kravitz is, working on, uh, is collaborating with Google. And on the Facebook stuff uh, that I, I did not get a chance to meet her, but I understand that Professor Cara Hilio is, uh, is, has uh, proposed some algorithm audits, has been looking at that. Uh, in the industrial internet area, uh, in the industrial internet area, uh, Professor Gulaga, uh, I had a chance to talk to him a little bit about what he's doing and how some of uh, his innovations are being used for monitoring Jindo Bridge in Korea. There's a lot of cutting edge, interdisciplinary work that is going on right here. Drones have the promise of making an impact in a lot of different industries. Built for purpose drones are being deployed today in agriculture to improve yields of seeds. Drones are being used to monitor and assess progress of construction projects. And earlier today, I met with uh, Professor Hoyam. Did I pronounce your name correctly or close enough? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, how he has been collaborating with aerospace, uh, uh, his colleagues in aerospace and civil engineering uh, for that. Another big thing is biotech. The promise of biotech is personalized medicine. Amazing progress in preventing, diagnosing, and treating disease. And one of the big challenges in biology, in biotech, is how do you analyze all of the genomic sequencing data, millions of sequences uh, that you need to analyze. And once again, I, Professor Sinha and Professor Han are doing multiple initiatives, one of which is big data to knowledge initiative that is in that area. A lot of possibilities in terms of what the next big thing is. So in conclusion, what I wanted to say was, Illinois prepared me extremely well for my career. Illinois prepared all of the distinguished alumni that have made such a huge impact on our industry that have shaped the technology, that have built companies that today dominate the industry. And today, I am certain after those uh, conversations with the faculty members that Illinois is educating the next generation of distinguished alumni who will change our world for the better. Thank you. We, we have uh, time for questions. Who wants to have the first question? There's a spe special award for the first question. Please, uh, uh, what's the best way to ask the questions? I, mean, can, I can hear you, or you can come to the mic. I was just going to say you talked a lot about um, the managers that made an impact on you and through your career. How would you describe your management style? Respect. I mean, I, again, I mean, it's, it's hard to distill it down to one word. Uh, but if I were to uh, distill it down, it would be respect. You didn't want to, uh, did you want a one, uh, one word answer or uh, you wanted something more, more than one, one word? One word is okay? I 
Hi, so I had a question regarding how you did your master's thesis in relational databases. Um, when you chose to do it in that field, did you have a mindset or a reason for choosing that? Did you see that as the next big thing at the time? I mean, what was your rationale? It would not be credible if I said I knew it all coming. No, actually, to give you a sense, I was at the right place at the right time. Uh, to give you a sense, I mean, Larry Ellison, how many of you have heard of Larry Ellison? You all have heard. And you've heard, you know he won the America Cup, America's Cup, and he's a very competitive individual. And uh, he's got a very big ego and very big aspirations, all that. You've heard all that, right? So when I joined Oracle, here's what he told me. He said, so Abe, someday, someday, Oracle could, end, uh, could become a $100 million company. That was all he thought it was going to be. So clearly, I hadn't a clue uh, in terms of how big it could be. But what I did have an interest was data, specifically about data management. That interest I had developed while I was in Illinois, partly because I couldn't figure out how hardware worked. I and mean, there were some classes that Professor Kubitz ta taught me that I struggled with. So it was impossible for me to get excited about something that I wasn't very good at. But databases, I could understand what they were, and I could, uh, so that was primarily one of interest and, and being convinced that there would be data that, well, after all, it was called data processing, so it, was, it didn't take the genius to figure that out. But that, that, was, that was what I knew. And I did understand enough about how relational databases were better than what preceded it, so I had that appreciation. What it became, I had no idea. So sometimes you just pursue an interest that turns out to be a great interest. But the story is, I was there at the right, at the right place at the right time. I like your chart where you showed earlier the, uh, there were some phases of where computing was, and you had several companies in there. One that was notable by its absence was Google. And so I was curious, where do you think Google fits into that your range of the history of computing and uh, its role? Uh, well, it emerged in the, in the era of, uh, that I had put in, Netscape and Amazon. And it would be somewhere between using computers for e-commerce and then using it for social engagement to somewhere in the middle. Um, or rather, you could say it spans both of them. But Google is a remarkable company in that they have managed to branch out into a lot of different areas. They started off, and they have an incredible business model. The, the business model is unlike any I've ever seen, where most of the money comes from, all of it comes from advertising. But they've been very smart in investing a lot of it into other areas as well. And obviously, they, they are a player in cloud and all those spaces as well now. Having been a computer science graduate, what, what skills did you have to pick up that made the most difference in your own career that you didn't get here? Uh, management. And I think it's, uh, or, or management in general, managing people and managing business. I, I never really take, I took a lot of classes in those two areas. But those were things that I had to learn along the way. And as I said, I mean, on the management side, what I learned was some of it cannot be taught. Some of it is you have to be authentic to who you are. So when you were asking me about uh, what my style is, I cannot be like Larry Ellison. I know that. I mean, he's, so for me to study him and all of, so part of it was just uh, exploring who you are and how you'd work with other people. And that, you could argue that perhaps that's something, we, we go through that discovery ourselves. But that was one when I went into management in terms of how you actually motivate people and how do you actually make sure you can delegate effectively. And then business management part of it was the, were the two things. From a computer science point of view, I was very well prepared. Well, I have one, um, uh, a question. <clears throat> um, one of the things that entrepreneurs often talk about is uh, responding to failures. 
because one of the things that's, that's, that's uh, often the, the hallmark of, 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 uh, of great business people is the ability to learn from something that didn't go very well, right? And to take some positive lessons and to sort of go at it again in a different way. And you've, you've offered a lot of um, e extraordinary examples of, of being the right guy in the right place at the right time with a, you know, a aggressive preparation. You know, uh, we, all, you know, we all love the Tom Siebel, Geneva Belford story. Right. I'm curious if you had any bad experiences in the business universe where you came, you know, you went into something thinking, okay, I know what's going to happen, and something completely different happened, and you learned something really new, and you know, and took it forward. Well, first of all, I've only had three jobs, which meant that <laughs> the sample size was too small for me to say. I've experienced a lot of failures. And I mean, the only thing I could say about failures is my first job before I got to uh, PCR, I applied to 50 companies. I only got one offer. And that felt pretty bad. That I'm not even employable after University of Illinois. But uh, let me, on a more serious note, let me tell you two, two failures, two things that I learned. One was, I, I told you about why or Oracle succeeded against IBM. It was that it ran on all the computers, portability was. So it was ingrained in all of us at Oracle uh, that you had to build software that was portable. When graphical user interfaces first came out, Macintosh, Xerox, uh, Star, there were a lot of other ones. Some of you may remember there was something called OSF Motif, there was something called Open Look, there was something called Presentation Manager, there was a, then later on Windows came. So when I embarked on that, I was managing that uh, development, I thought, Oracle strategy, portability meant that we needed to build development tools that would allow developers to build portable user interfaces. What that meant was that there's an abstraction that you could run it on all the different things. Now, it turned out to be a bad decision because Windows dominated and more or less killed all of the other graphical user interfaces. So and now I learned an important lesson. The same strategy, when the world changes, Reconsider your strategy. That was one lesson. Now that turned out, that had a happy ending eventually because when the web happened, we had done a lot of the work that would allow us to move to the web a little bit faster. But that was a, bad, uh, that was a very painful process in uh, uh, space for my career at all. The second one is a business decision, which is uh, in the case of Informatica, I mean, I showed you the stock chart and all that kind of stuff. Informatica got rewarded because it was able, uh, because it, the company could grow the revenue and become more profitable at the same time. And that meant there were certain expectations that people had. People expected that next year you'll do better on both fronts than you did last year. Now, at some point, we all have our limits. You cannot keep getting better forever. At least, I don't think so. If you have come across someone who was capable of doing that, let me know. I'll invest in them. Now, what that meant was we had this expectation that we needed to figure out how we deal with that. And we didn't. And we realized the hard way that you cannot continue getting more and more profitable and growing uh, again. So that was a very painful decision. I mean, the, that was very public as well because the stock price went down. So that meant everyone knew that uh, that mistake was made. Now, we recovered from it. So that was one was manage your expectations well was one lesson. And the second one is if the wor when the world changes, change your strategy. It sounds simple now, but when it was going on, it did not sound, I mean, it did not seem simple. Hindsight always makes it really tough yeah. to look simple. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Yes. Um, you, talk, <coughs> you talked about uh, like the next big things, which is like the Internet of Things, and so I want to know like about your views on data science and like how it's sort of related to Internet of Things because we get all the data from sensors. But like, where do you think that is going, and how important do you think that is? Uh, I think it is very important because let me, let me give you my view in terms of the world of data. 
Uh, there are a lot of buzzwords that uh, you hear about big data and a lot of it. And I think I mean, most of them mean absolutely nothing. It's nonsensical. When people talk about big data, most of the time they don't know what they're talking about. Other than, of course, it's big and it's data. So how could it not be big data? Now, from a world of data perspective, the world that I was taught at Illinois was dealing with transaction data. And that's why when you look at relational databases and the, 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 the provisions there are for integrity, concurrency, and all those are essentially for a type of data that is incredibly valuable that you simply cannot lose. The world of data, since the consumer internet companies emerged, like including Google and others, it's not about transactions, it's about interactions. There's search interactions going on, there's social posts going on, there are machine interactions going on. So the world of data has now become not just transactions, but interactions. Now, there's a fundamental difference in terms of interaction. If somebody tweets, if Donald Trump tweets, and you miss it, it's not the end of the world, for at least the Democrats. But if, if uh, you lose a transaction, it would be. So it's a little bit of very different kind of thing. And even if you look at within interaction data, the machine and all of the, the latency and all that. Now, the fact that we have so many new types of interaction data also opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of you could anticipate things. Because the transaction was, I got the order. The anticipation is they're on our website, they put something in the shopping cart, and what did they do? They added more things, and then something didn't quite happen, or you can influence them by putting an ad. So as a result of capturing all of that, you have a lot of possibilities. And that possibilities, in terms of what you can do with that data, is in almost every single field. Because this data is being captured everywhere. I mean, the sensor data that is being captured or any of the, the automobile, the connected car. And for that reason, understanding how all of that data or the data science becomes critically important. But there is one consideration. Data science within it, the algorithms that you need in order to make sense of the data are context specific. So if you're doing data science for biotech, it's a little bit different than if you're doing data science for surveillance, for, as an example. But the basic uh, idea of data science, I think, is here to stay. Other questions? No? OK, let's give one more round of applause for our speaker. Thank, Thank you. you.